Hello there. There's already quite a bit of introductory information on using digital hydrometers on the web. So today we're going to take a deep dive into a couple of digital hydrometers. The float from Brew Brain and the wrap pill from Cakeland. Now I'll also be referencing the open source iSpindle for the purposes of using the components in that project for baseline comparisons because those components have kind of become the de facto standard for most of these digital hydrometer devices and that might be useful. I don't actually have an eye spindle in hand so we'll be using sources and material that I can get from the web. Let's have a look at BrewBrain's interface for the float and direct your attention over to the left side where the user panel allows you to select the different functions from a column of icons uh, with no text description associated with them. You can see the fonts are fairly large so I probably don't even need my glasses to read these and there is um, a rather unique approach to the different pages and their layout. For example here you've got some blogs and um, under there the last blog over here you can show some blog posts. Before we do that uh, we'll just show you what some of these other pages look like and the one we're on now this icon is rather interesting. In the past I had a uh, client um, contact me because he had gotten the impression that you could drop the float into a narrow neck glass carboy which won't work for any of these digital hydrometers in the existing tubes that they're in as far as I know. Um, you'll also see that there's a fair bit of uh, wasted space. Uh, to me being Scottish and I'm by nature uh, parsimonious so real estate uh, to me translates to value and uh, I don't see the value in all this white space when probably some more data could be put into there. So you can decide for yourself what you think of that. Integrations, um, which is one of the stronger points of this. You can see some public brews which I've never really uh, found any use for. Uh, it mostly seems to be people that start up uh, from the first time with a float and uh, are trying to figure out what they're doing and you just don't really gain a lot from that. Here you can see the better icon of still having the float in the wart um, in what appears to be a glass carboy. And uh, just as an aside, I did send Brewbrain a note about my client's observation on this and uh, the response was, yeah, we're aware of it, uh, too bad, so sad. That was about a year ago and of course it's still here now. So um, back to the dashboard and um, we can see here that um, the readings you'll get are very easy. The only uh, other problem I have with this uh, particular graphical interface is that these settings um, will disappear, they time out and then you are forced to log in again to your uh, account on the Brewbane portal in order to see your settings being displayed in real time which of course is by default 15 minutes as opposed to the pill which has a default of 60 but which apparently can be changed. Well let's have a look at the user interface on the pill. Here we have it all in one window so I like that aspect of it that there's only the one window to follow. The specific gravity is immediately uh, apparent by looking at the shaded blue area and the next important measurement is the temperature on the red line. You can also see your battery and signal strength on there as well. So initial impressions are good on this. 
and it'll remain to be seen uh, when we do some actual testing with it in the wart how customizable it is and how well it all works and the other thing I'm going to be interested in is to see if this one uh, times out when you're monitoring for a few weeks and whether you have to log back into the portal or whether you can keep it alive either by specifying that or maybe even using some of the uh, keep alive style programs that are available in uh, Chrome or whatever browser is the one. Any play in the circuit board inside the tube could really mess with the calibration so a retaining ring holds it very solidly in Brewbrain has told me that you cannot place a circuit board like this back into a tube, reinsert the ring, and then use the recalibration utility in order to get it working again properly. However, once I had done this, I had nothing to lose, so I thought I would give it a try and see what the results would be. So I started a new brew, and I placed a brand new float into it that was unmodified. After I recalibrated the other float uh, that I had taken apart, I then also placed that into the new brew beside the new float so that I would be able to compare the performance graphs between the two of them. After the brew had completed, I overlaid the two graphs one on top of the other to see how the variability would be between the two of them, especially being interested to see if the one that had been recalibrated would be usable at all. And if we are going by the results of this graph, it would appear that the recalibration utility worked fine after I had removed the circuit board and put it back into the float tube. At the uh, chipsets on the float to start with, and just for reference here, I'll show you the large one to start with. So the part under the lid, when you remove the lid of the float, which would be the top of the float, here's your connector. And so that'll be your landmark reference. And these are the chips that we're going to be interested in. And the reason uh, we're looking at this is not to try and uh, do a tutorial on how to put some chips on a board yourself, but it's more out of interest to see how common these chips are or may not be given the different uh, digital hydrometers that are on the market. So I was interested to know, for example, uh, how much in common, again, if we use the eye spindle as a benchmark, would these chips have with the more uh, ubiquitous chips that are available, say through the Raspberry Pi market or uh, so on. That's what we're going to focus on in here. And so here what I've done is I've uh, broken them down and labeled them here to show what they are. So. Let's start first of all with the uh, 8266 Wi-Fi chip and uh, these are typically uh, about three to four dollars and um, you'll find that this one does ha have a commonality with the eye spindle and I have still got <coughs> to wait for the uh, pill to arrive the day before I'm going to be able to look at that and see if it shares that so that'll come later in this video. So next we've got the uh, wind bond uh, the uh, 25Q32 which would be the memory chip here and that also shares commonality with the eye spindle and those are you can find those on the internet for <coughs> maybe Amazon or AliExpress for about a dollar twenty-five US, <coughs> and um, this is the flash memory chip. So next we have the uh, accelerometer gyroscope here, which is the uh, uh, what is that? Um, in 
Invincense MPU 6050 3 axis accelerometer gyroscope, and that's right there. Those are also between three and four dollars, just like the SOC chip, uh, the 8266 for the Wi Fi down there. So they're about the same price. Then we go to the USB to serial chip, uh, those are about a dollar fifty, and this is where there may be some differences between the eye spindle. The, the CH340C chip uh, is commonly a Chinese chip. Uh, you find them quite available on places like AliExpress. And uh, I believe that I read that the eye spindle uses the Silicone Labs 2104 or the Sil Labs 2102 chip instead. Um, the Sil Labs chips are a, a little bit more expensive, but now when you're talking things down to on the level of a dollar or two. Not a huge difference, but some people feel, and probably justifiably so, that the Silicon Labs chip, they are better supported. And uh, I did find that to be the case when I was working with uh, building cables for programming radios and the difference between the prolific, well, basically the, the uh, copy copied prolific chipsets uh, and the prolific were out of, I think they're out of Taiwan, the Silicon Labs played much better with Windows drivers. So driver support can be an important factor in terms of tearing your hair out or not when you're trying to plug something into your computer. And uh, however, I haven't really done much uh, in that regard. And um, I think most of the firmware upgrades went out are done through the transceiver which we're going to look at next anyway. So those are the chips in that area and then um, to a lesser extent we've got the battery protection MOSFET over here and uh, that is about, uh, what is that, it's about um, 10 cents and then we have the uh, battery, the, the constant voltage linear battery charging circuit uh, regulator chip here and that one is uh, the TP4056 same as the eye spindle uh, as well and uh, those are about 25 cents in value. Now we're going to move on to the other end of the board which uh, would be uh, I guess this would be now the bottom, which is about where you'd want to see the temperature sensor, which is over here. And this module here is the temperature sensor. And I do think that you do want temperature to be taken from in the wart rather than up near the top of the lid where it's in the open air. And then the other thing on the bottom of your float, uh, again, by bottom I mean the end opposite from where the lid would be and you can see the orientation here just by virtue that's why I left the serial number on there. Um, this is the Wi-Fi transceiver module so it pretty much deals with uh, the communications protocols between the float and your router and this can be important in terms of uh, how easy or how hard it makes it for example to get this thing all set up on your network and get it all working for you. We'll start off here with an image of the main circuit board in the wrap pill and uh, you can't see it in here but it's about two-thirds as long and a little bit fatter than the circuit board that's in the float. The uh, components are arranged differently and uh, I can't really recognize a lot of them in terms of similarities between the eye spindle and the pill and the float. Uh, one of the things that caught my attention is um, it does have the standard uh, Wi-Fi antenna on this end like we see on the edge of the float. But what I wasn't sure about was this copper band 
that goes around the main part of the component traces and um, I was wondering if that was an enhancement to the Wi-Fi antenna that you also can see here. If anybody could comment on that below, that would be appreciated. The uh, other components, the only thing that is really much for similarities, and we'll see them here, uh, we'll zoom in on here, is the flash. Uh, the only difference being that uh, the chip maker in this case is a Giga Device GD and in the float it's uh, a wind bond chip but they're both uh, 25Q32 32 megabit chips. Otherwise um, the ESP32 chip uh, on the pill on a float it's an ESP8266 the difference being that on the pill it has Bluetooth uh, capabilities embedded in it but as of uh, when I'm making this I'm under the understanding that Wrapped or Kglan has not figured out how to implement the Bluetooth code yet and they say that will be coming in a first future firmware update. Another interesting aspect of uh, this which uh, you can, if you follow my mouse cursor here, this is actually a cutout on the circuit board. The back side of that is actually the battery body and there's two bridges for uh, getting the traces over to the other part of the circuit board. Uh, that was an interesting looking design cutout that I was wondering what that was for, whether it was for some sort of airflow for example and it seems to define uh, on this island uh, or maybe you'd call it a peninsula the chips on there uh, which I believe are the accelerator module um, <coughs> that it's uh, I, I get that from the chip numbers that I can find on here that seem to indicate that they use those chips for the accelerator gyroscope uh, three axis guys measures velocity, orientation, acceleration, uh, displacement, and other motion. And here I believe this to be the transceiver module. And again, it doesn't bear any resemblance to what I believe is the transceiver module over here on the float. And then the temperature sensor also is easy to find on the float but I haven't had a lot of confidence in terms of isolating what I think is the same temperature sensor on the pill. I'm guessing it could be uh, this, but that's just a wild guess. And I can't seem to match up anything else on here. So again, if anyone has any further information on that, if they'd like to leave it below, that would be much appreciated. So next we're going to have to examine exactly how these components may or may not stack up against similar components when we put it into an actual fermentation process and watch how it goes with the wort over a period of time from the start of the ferment till when we get a uh, basically a, a static line indicating that the fermentation process has stopped. So uh, that will come in a, another installment in this season two series of videos. Uh, hopefully it'll be the next one.